Welcome to the Decompression Zone. Tonight I will be reading for you Part 4 of Jack London's White Fang. Chapter 1 The Enemy of His Kind Had there been in White Fang's nature any possibility, no matter how remote, of his ever coming to fraternize with his kind, such possibility was irretrievably destroyed when he was made leader of the sled team. For now the dogs hated him, hated him for the extra meat bestowed upon him by Metzah hated him for all the real and fancied favors he received, hated him for that he fled always at the head of the team, his waving brush of a tail and his perpetually retreating hindquarters forever maddening their eyes. And White Fang just as bitterly hated them, being sled leader was anything but gratifying to him. To be compelled to run away before the yelling pack, every dog of which, for three years, he had thrashed and mastered, was almost more than he could endure. But endure it he must, or perish, and the life that was in him had no desire to perish out. The moment Mitza gave his order for the start, that moment the whole team, with eager savage cries, sprang forward at White Fang. There was no defense for him. If he turned upon them, Mitza would throw the stinging lash of the whip into his face. Only remained to him to run away. He could not encounter that howling horde with his tail and hind quarters. These were scarcely fit weapons with which to meet the many merciless fangs. So, run away he did, violating his own nature and pride with every leap he made, and leaping all day long. One cannot violate the promptings of one's nature without having that nature recoil upon itself. Such a recoil is like that of a hair, made to grow out from the body, turning unnaturally upon the direction of its growth, and growing into the body, a rankling, festering thing to hurt. And so, with White Fang, Every urge of his being impelled him to spring upon the pack that cried at his heels. But it was the will of the gods that this should not be. And behind the will to enforce it was the whip of caribou gut, with its biting thirty-foot lash. So White Fang could only eat his heart in bitterness and develop a hatred and malice commensurate with the ferocity and indomitability of his nature. If ever a creature was the enemy of its kind, White Fang was that creature. He asked no quarter, gave none. He was continually marred and scarred by the teeth of the pack, and as continually he left his own marks upon the pack. Unlike most leaders, who, when camp was made and the dogs were unhitched, huddled near to the gods for protection, White Fang disdained such protection. He walked boldly about the camp, inflicting punishment in the night for what he had suffered in the day. In the time before he was made leader of the team, the pack had learned to get out of his way. But now it was different. Excited by the day-long pursuit of him, 
works way subconsciously by the insistent iteration on the brains of the sight of him fleeing away. Mastered by the feeling of mastery, enjoyed all day, the dogs could not bring themselves to give way to him. When he appeared amongst them, there was always a squabble. His progress was marked by snarl and snap and growl. The very atmosphere he breathed was surcharged with hatred and malice. And this but served to increase the hatred and the malice within him. When Mitsa cried out his command for the team to stop, White Fang obeyed. At first, this caused trouble for the other dogs. All of them would spring upon the hated leader only to find the tables turned. Behind him would be Mitsa, the great whip singing in his hand. So the dogs came to understand that when the team stopped by order, White Fang was to be let alone. But when White Fang stopped without orders, then it was allowed them to spring upon him and destroy him, if they could. After several experiences, White Fang never stopped without orders. He learned quickly. It was in the nature of things that he must learn quickly, if he were to survive the unusually severe conditions under which life was vouchsafed him. But the dogs could never learn the lesson to leave him alone in camp. Each day, pursuing him and crying defiance at him, the lesson of the previous night was erased, and that night would have to be learned over again, to be as immediately forgotten. Besides, there was a greater consistence in their dislike of him. They sensed between themselves and him a difference of kind, cause sufficient in itself for hostility. Like him, they were domesticated wolves, but they had been domesticated for generations. Much of the wild had been lost, so that to them the wild was unknown, the terrible, the ever menacing and ever warring. But to him, in appearance and action and impulse, still clung the wild. He symbolized it, was its personification, so that when they showed their teeth to him, they were defending themselves against the powers of destruction that lurked in the shadows of the forest and in the dark beyond the campfire. But there was one lesson the dogs did learn, and that was to keep together. White Fang was too terrible for any of them to face single-handed. They met him with the mass formation, otherwise he would have killed them, one by one, in a night. As it was, he never had a chance to kill them. He might roll the dog off its feet, but the pack would be upon him before he could follow up and deliver the deadly throat stroke. At the first hint of conflict, the whole team drew together and faced him. The dogs had quarrels among themselves, but these were forgotten when trouble was brewing with White Fang. On the other hand, try as they would, they could not kill White Fang. He was too quick for them, too formidable, too wise. He avoided tight places and always backed out of it when they bade fair to surround him. While, as for getting him off his feet, there was no dog among them capable of doing the trick. His feet clung to the earth with the same tenacity that he clung to life. For that matter, life and footing were synonymous in this unending warfare with the pack, and none knew it better than White Fang. So he became the enemy of his kind, 
domesticated wolves that they were softened by the fires of man, weakened in the sheltering shadow of man's strength. White Fang was bitter and implacable. The clay of him was so molded. He declared vendetta against all dogs. And so terribly did he live this vendetta that Grey Beaver, fierce savage himself, could not but marvel at White Fang's ferocity. Never, he swore, had there been the like of this animal, and the Indians in strange villages swore likewise when they considered the tale of his killings amongst their dogs. When White Fang was nearly five years old, Grey Beaver took him on another great journey, and long remembered was the havoc he worked amongst the dogs of the many villages along the Mackenzie, across the Rockies and down the Porcupine to the Yukon. He reveled in the vengeance he wreaked upon his kind. They were ordinary, unsuspecting dogs. They were not prepared for his swiftness and directness, for his attack without warning. They did not know him for what he was, a lightning flash of slaughter. They bristled up to him, stiff-legged and challenging, while he, wasting no time on elaborate preliminaries, snapping into action like a steel spring, was at their throats and destroying them before they knew what was happening, and while they were yet in the throes of surprise. He became an adept at fighting. He economized. He never wasted his strength, never tussled. He was in too quick for that, and if he missed, was out again too quick. The dislike of the wolf for close quarters was his to an unusual degree. He could not endure a prolonged contact with another body. It smacked of danger. It made him frantic. He must be away, free, on his own legs, touching no living thing. It was the wild still clinging to him, asserting itself through him. This feeling had been accentuated by the Ishmaelite life he had led from his puppyhood. Danger lurked in contacts. It was the trap, ever the trap. The fear of it lurking deep in the life of him, woven into the fiber of him. In consequence, the strange dogs he encountered had no chance against him. He eluded the fangs. He got them or got away, himself untouched in either event. In the natural course of things, there were exceptions to this. There were times when several dogs, pitching onto him, punished him before he could get away. And there were times when a single dog scored deeply on him. But these were accidents. In the main, so efficient a fighter had he become, he went his way unscathed. Another advantage he possessed was that of correctly judging time and distance. Not that he did this consciously, however. He did not calculate such things. It was all automatic. His eyes saw correctly and the nerves carried the vision correctly to his brain. The parts of him were better adjusted than those of the average dog. They worked together more smoothly and steadily. His was a better, far better, nervous, mental and muscular coordination. When his eyes conveyed to his brain the moving image of an action, his brain, without conscious effort, knew the space that limited that action, and the time required for its completion. 
Thus, he could avoid the leap of another dog, or the drive of its fangs, and at the same moment could seize the infinitesimal fraction of time in which to deliver his own attack. Body and brain, his was a more perfect mechanism. Not that he was to be praised for it. Nature had been more generous to him than the average animal, and that was all. It was in the summer that White Fang arrived at Fort Yukon. Grey Beaver had crossed the great watershed between Mackenzie and the Yukon in the late winter and spent the spring in hunting among the western outlying spurs of the Rockies. Then, after the breakup of the ice on the Porcupine, he had built a canoe and paddled down that stream to where it effected its junction with the Yukon, just under the Arctic Circle. Here stood the old Hudson Bay Company Fort, and here were many Indians, much food, and unprecedented excitement. It was the summer of 1898, and thousands of gold hunters were going up the Yukon to Dawson and the Klondike. Still hundreds of miles from the golds, nevertheless many of them had been on the way for years and the least any of them had traveled to get that far was 5,000 miles, with some had come from the other side of the world. Here Grey Beaver stopped. A whisper of the gold rush had reached his ears, and he had come with several bales of furs, and another of gutsel mittens and moccasins. He would not have ventured so long a trip had he not expected a generous profit, but what he had expected was nothing to what he realized. His wildest dreams had not exceeded a hundred percent profit. He made a thousand percent. And like a true Indian, he settled down the trade carefully and slowly, even if it took all summer and the rest of the winter to dispose of his goods. It was at Fort Yukon that White Fang saw his first white man. As compared with the Indians he had known, they were to him another race of beings, a race of superior gods. They impressed him as possessing superior power, and it was in power that God had rests. White Fang did not reason it out, did not in his mind make the sharp generalization that the white gods were more powerful. It was a feeling, nothing more, and yet nonetheless potent. As in his puppyhood, the looming bulks of the tipis, man reared, had affected him as manifestations of power. So was he affected now by the houses and the huge fort, all of massive logs. Here was power. Those white gods were strong. They possessed greater mastery over matter than the gods he had known. Most powerful among which was Grey Beaver. And yet... Grey Beaver was as a child god among these white-skinned ones. To be sure, White Fang only felt these things. He was not conscious of them. Yet it is upon feeling, more often than thinking, that animals act. And every act White Fang now performed was based upon the feeling that the white men were the superior gods. In the first place, he was very suspicious of them. There was no telling what unknown terrors were theirs, what unknown hurts they could administer. He was curious to observe them, fearful of being noticed by them. 
For the first few hours, he was content with slinking around and watching them from a safe distance. Then he saw that no harm befell the dogs that were near to them, and he came closer. In turn, he was an object of great curiosity to them. His wolfish appearance caught their eyes at once, and they pointed him out to one another. This act of pointing put White Fang on his guard, and when they tried to approach him, he showed his teeth and backed away. No one succeeded in laying a hand on him, and it was well that they did not. White Fang soon learned that very few of these gods, no more than a dozen, lived at this place. Every two or three days, a steamer, another and colossal manifestation of power, came into the bank and stopped for several hours. And the white men came from off these steamers and went away on them again. There seemed untold numbers of these white men. In the first day or so, he saw more of them than he had seen Indians in all his life. And as the days went by, they continued to come up the river, stop, and then go on up the river, out of sight. But if the white gods were all powerful, their dogs did not amount to much. This white thing quickly discovered by mixing with those that came ashore with their masters. They were irregular shapes and sizes. Some were short-legged, too short. Others were long-legged, too long. They had hair instead of fur, and a few had very little hair at that. And none of them knew how to fight. As an enemy of his kind, it was in White Fang's province to fight with them. This he did, and he quickly achieved for them a mighty contempt. They were soft and helpless, made much noise, and floundered around clumsily, trying to accomplish by main strength what he accomplished by dexterity and cunning. They rushed bellowing at him. He sprang to the side. They did not know what had become of him, and in that moment he struck them on the shoulder, rolling them off their feet and delivering a stroke at the throat. Sometimes this stroke was successful, and the stricken dog rolled in the dirt to be pounced upon and torn to pieces by the pack of Indian dogs that waited. White Fang was wise. He had long since learned that the gods were made angry when the dogs were killed. The white men were no exception to this. So he was content when he had overthrown and slashed white the throat of one of the dogs to draw back and let the pack go in and do the cruel finishing work. It was then that the white man rushed in, visiting the wrath heavily on the pack, while White Fang went free. He would stand off at a little distance and look on, while stones, clubs, axes, and all sorts of weapons fell upon his fellows. White Fang was very wise. But his fellows grew wise in their own way, and in this White Fang grew wise with them. They learned that it was when a steamer first tied to the bank that they had their fun. After the first two or three strange dogs had been downed and destroyed, the white men hustled their own animals back on board and wreaked savage vengeance on the offenders. One white man, having seen his dog, a setter torn to pieces before his eyes, drew a revolver. He fired rapidly, six times, and six of the pack lay dead or dying. And 
another manifestation of power that sank deep into White Fang's consciousness. White Fang enjoyed it all. He did not love his kind, and he was shrewd enough to escape her to himself. At first, the killing of the white man's dogs had been a diversion. After a time, it became his occupation. There was no work for him to do. Grey Beaver was busy trading and getting wealthy. So White Fang hung around the landing with the disreputable gang of Indian dogs waiting for steamers. With the arrival of a steamer, the fun began. After a few minutes, by the time the white man had got over their surprise, the gang scattered. The fun was over until the next steamer should arrive. But it can scarcely be said that White Fang was a member of the gang. He did not mingle with it, but remained aloof always himself, and was even feared by it. It is true, he worked with it. He picked the quarrel with the strange dog while the gang waited, and when he had overthrown the strange dog, the gang went in to finish it. But it is equally true that he then withdrew, leaving the gang to receive the punishment of the outraged gods. It did not require much exertion to pick these calls. All he had to do when the strange dogs came ashore was to show himself. When they saw him, they rushed for him. It was their instinct. He was the wild, the unknown, the terrible, the ever menacing. The thing that prowled in the darkness around the fires of the primeval world when they, cowering close to the fires, were reshaping their instincts, learning to fear the wild out of which they had come, and which they had deserted and betrayed. Generation by generation, down all the generations, had this fear of the wild been stamped into their natures. For centuries, the wild had stood for terror and destruction, and during all this time, free lessons had been theirs from their masters to kill the things of the wild. In doing this, they had protected both themselves and the gods whose companionship they shared. And so, fresh from the soft southern world, these dogs trotting down the gangplank and out upon the Yukon shore, had but to see White Fang to experience the irresistible impulse to rush upon him and destroy him. They might be town of the dogs, but the instinctive fear of the wild was theirs just the same. Not alone with their own eyes did they see the wolfish creature in the clear light of day standing before them. They saw him with the eyes of their ancestors, and by their inherited memory they knew White Fang for the wolf, and they remembered the ancient feud. All of which served to make White Fang's days enjoyable. If the sight of him drove these strange dogs upon him, so much the better for him. So much the worse for them. They looked upon him as a legitimate prey, and as legitimate prey, he looked upon them. Not for nothing had he first seen the light of day in a lonely lair, and fought his first fights with the ptarmigan, the weasel, and the lynx. And not for nothing had his puppyhood been made bitter by the persecution of Lip Lip and the whole puppy pack. It might have been otherwise, and he would then have been otherwise. Had Lip Lip not existed, he would have passed his puppyhood with the other puppies and grown up more dog-like and with more liking for dogs. Had 
Grey Beaver possessed the plummet of affection and love. He might have sounded the deeps of White Fang's nature and brought up to the surface all manner of kindly qualities. But these things had not been so. The clay of White Fang had been molded until he became what he was, morose and lonely, unloving and ferocious, the enemy of all his kind. Chapter 2 The Mad God A small number of white men lived in Fort Yukon. These men had been long in the country. They called themselves sourdoughs and took great pride in so classifying themselves. For other men, new in the land, they felt nothing but disdain. The men who came ashore from the steamers were newcomers. They were known as Chechequos, and they always wilted at the application of the name. They made the bread with baking powder. This was the invidious distinction between them and the sourdoughs, who, forsooth, made the bread from sourdough, because they had no baking powder. All of which is neither here nor there. The men in the fort disdained the newcomers and enjoyed seeing them come to grief. Especially did they enjoy the havoc worked amongst the newcomers' dogs by White Fang and his disreputable gang. When a steamer arrived, the men of the fort made it a point always to come down to the bank and see the fun. They looked forward to it with as much anticipation as did the Indian dogs. While they were not slow to appreciate the savage and crafty part played by White Fang. But there was one man amongst them who particularly enjoyed the sport. He would come running at the first sound of a steamboat's whistle. And when the last fight was over and White Fang and the pack had scattered, he would return slowly to the fort, his face heavy with regret. Sometimes, when a soft southland dog went down, shrieking its death cry under the fangs of the pack, this man would be unable to contain himself and would leap into the air and cry out with delight. And always he had a sharp and covetous eye for White Fang. This man was called Beauty by the other man of the fort. No one knew his first name. And in general, he was known in the country as Beauty Smith. But he was anything save a beauty. To antithesis was due his naming. He was preeminently unbeautiful. Nature had been niggardly with him. He was a small man to begin with and upon his meager frame was deposited an even more strikingly meager head. Its apex might be likened to a point. In fact, in his boyhood, before he had been named Beauty by his fellows, he had been called Pinhead. Backward from the apex, his head slanted down to his neck, and forward it slanted uncompromisingly to meet a low, remarkably wide forehead. Beginning here, as though regretting her parsimony, nature had spread his features with a lavish hand. His eyes were large, and between them was the distance of two eyes. His face, in relation to the rest of him, was prodigious. In order to discover the necessary area, Nature had given him an enormous proconathus jaw. It was wide and heavy and protruded outward and down until it seemed to rest on his chest. 
Possibly this appearance was due to the weariness of the slender neck, unable properly to support so great a burden. This jaw gave the impression of ferocious determination, but something lacked. Perhaps it was from excess, perhaps the jaw was too large, at any rate it was a liar. Beauty Smith was known far and wide as the weakest of weak kneed and sniveling cowards. To complete his description, his teeth were large and yellow, while the two eye teeth, larger than their fellows, showed under his lean lips like fangs. His eyes were yellow and muddy, as though nature had run short on pigments and squeezed together the dregs of all her tubes. It was the same with his hair, sparse and irregular of growth, muddy yellow and dirty yellow, rising on his head and sprouting out of his face in unexpected tufts and bunches, in appearance like clumped and wind-blown grain. In short, Beauty Smith was a monstrosity, and the blame of it lay elsewhere. He was not responsible. The clay of him had been so molded in the making. He did the cooking for the other man in the fort, the dishwashing and the drudgery. They did not despise him. Rather did they tolerate him in a broad human way, as one tolerates any creature evilly treated in the making. Also, they feared him. His cowardly rages made them dread a shot in the back or poison in their coffee. But somebody had to do the cooking, and whatever else his shortcomings, Beauty Smith could cook. This was the man that looked at White Fang, delighted in his ferocious prowess, and desired to possess him. He made overtures to White Fang from the first. White Fang began by ignoring him. Later on, when the overtures became more insistent, White Fang bristled and bared his teeth and backed away. He did not like the man. The feel of him was bad. He sensed the evil in him and feared the extended hand and the attempts at soft-spoken speech. And because of all this, he hated the man. With the simpler creatures, good and bad are things simply understood. The good stands for all things that bring easement and satisfaction and surcease from pain. Therefore, the good is liked. The bad stands for all things that are fraught with discomfort, menace and hurt, and is hated accordingly. White Fang's feel of Beauty Smith was bad. From the man's distorted body and twisted mind, in occult ways, like mists rising from malarial marshes, came emanations of the unhealth within. Not by reasoning, not by the five senses alone, but by other and remoter and uncharted senses came the feeling to White Fang that the man was ominous with evil, pregnant with hurtfulness, and therefore a bad thing, and wisely to be hated. White Fang was in Grey Beaver's camp when Beauty Smith first visited it. At the faint sound of his distant feet before he came in sight, White Fang knew who was coming and began to bristle. He had been lying down in an abandon of comfort, but he rose quickly and as the man arrived slid away in true wolf fashion to the edge of the camp. 
He did not know what they said, but he could see the man and Grey Beaver talking together. Once the man pointed at him, and White Fang snarled back as though the hand were just descending upon him instead of being, as it was, fifty feet away. The man laughed at this, and White Fang slunk away to the sheltering woods. His head turned to observe as he glided softly over the ground. Grey Beaver refused to sell the dog. He had grown rich with his trading and stood in need of nothing. Besides, White Fang was a valuable animal, the strongest sled dog he had ever owned, and the best leader. Furthermore, there was no dog like him on the Mackenzie, nor the Yukon. He could fight. He killed other dogs as easily as men killed mosquitoes. Beauty Smith's eyes lighted up at this, and he licked his thin lips with an eager tongue. No, White Fang was not for sale at any price. But Beauty Smith knew the ways of Indians. He visited Grey Beaver's camp often, and hidden under his coat was always a black bottle or so. One of the potencies of whiskey is the breeding of thirst. Grey Beaver got the thirst. His fevered membranes and burnt stomach began to clamor for more and more of the scorching fluid, while his brain, thrust all awry by the unknown stimulant, permitted him to go any length to obtain it. The money he had received for his furs and mittens and moccasins began to go. It went faster and faster, and the shorter his money sack grew, the shorter grew his temper. In the end, his money and goods and temper were all gone. Nothing remained to him but his thirst, a prodigious possession in itself that grew more prodigious with every sober breath he drew. Then it was that Beauty Smith had a talk with him again about the sale of White Fang. But this time the prize offered was in bottles, not dollars, and Grey Beaver's ears were more eager to hear. You catch him, dog, you take him all right, was his last word. And the bottles were delivered, but after two days, you catch him, dog, were Beauty Smith's words to Grey Beaver. White Fang slunk into camp one evening and dropped down with a sigh of content. The dreaded white god was not there. For days his manifestations of desire to lay hands on him had been growing more insistent, and during that time White Fang had been compelled to avoid the camp. He did not know what evil was threatened by those insistent hands. He knew only that they did threaten evil of some sort, and that it was best for him to keep out of their reach. But scarcely had he lain down when Grey Beaver staggered over to him and tied a leather thong around his neck. He sat down beside White Fang, holding the end of the thong in his hand. In the other hand he held the bottle, which, from time to time, was inverted above his head, to the accompaniment of gurgling noises. An hour of this passed, when the vibrations of feet in contact with the ground foreran the one who approached. White Fang heard it first, and he was bristling with recognition while Grey Beaver still nodded stupidly. White Fang tried to draw the thong softly out of his master's hand, but the relaxed fingers closed tightly, and Grey Beaver roused himself. Beauty Smith strode into camp and stood over White Fang. 
He snarled softly up at the thing of fear, watching keenly the deportment of the hands. One hand extended outward and began to descend upon his head. His soft snarl grew tense and harsh. The hand continued slowly to descend while he crouched beneath it, eyeing it malignantly, his snarl growing shorter and shorter as, with quickening breath, it approached its culmination. Suddenly he snapped, striking with his fangs like a snake. The hand was jerked back and the teeth came together emptily with a sharp click. Beauty Smith was frightened and angry. Great beaver clouded White Fang alongside the head, so that he cowered down close to the earth in respectful obedience. White Fang's suspicious eyes followed every movement. He saw Beauty Smith go away and return with a stout club. Then the end of the song was given over to him by Great Beaver. Beauty Smith started to walk away. The song grew taut. White Fang resisted it. Grey Beaver clouded him right and left to make him get up and follow. He obeyed, but with a rush, hurling himself upon the stranger who was dragging him away. Beauty Smith did not jump away. He had been waiting for this. He swung the club smartly, stopping the rush midway and smashing White Fang down upon the ground. Grey Beaver laughed and nodded approval. Beauty Smith tightened the song again, and White Fang crawled limply and dizzily to his feet. He did not rush a second time. One smash from the club was sufficient to convince him that the White God knew how to handle it, and he was too wise to fight the inevitable. So he followed morosely at Beauty Smith's heels, his tail between his legs, yet snarling softly under his breath. But Beauty Smith kept a wary eye on him, and the club was held always ready to strike. At the fort, Beauty Smith left him securely tight and went in to bed. White Fang waited an hour. Then he applied his teeth to the thong, and in the space of ten seconds was free. He had wasted no time with his teeth. There had been no useless gnawing. The thong was cut across, diagonally, almost as clean as though done by a knife. White Fang looked up at the fort, at the same time bristling and growling. Then he turned and trotted back to Grey Beaver's camp. He owed no allegiance to this strange and terrible god. He had given himself to Grey Beaver, and to Grey Beaver he considered he still belonged. But what had occurred before was repeated, with a difference. Grey Beaver again made him fast with a thong, and in the morning turned him over to Beauty Smith. And here was where the difference came in. Beauty Smith gave him a beating. Tied securely, White Fang could only rage futilely and endure the punishment. Club and whip were both used upon him, and he experienced the worst beating he had ever received in his life. Even the big beating given him in his puppyhood by Grey Beaver was mild compared with this. Beauty Smith enjoyed the task. He delighted in it. He gloated over his victim, and his eyes flamed dully as he swung the whip or club and listened to White Fang's cries of pain and to his helpless bellows and snarls. For Beauty Smith was cruel in the way that cowards are cruel. 
cringing and sniveling himself before the blows or angry speech of a man. He revenged himself, in turn, upon creatures weaker than he. All life likes power, and Beauty Smith was no exception. Denied the expression of power amongst his own kind, he fell back upon the lesser creatures, and there vindicated the life that was in him. But Beauty Smith had not created himself, and no blame was to be attached to him. He had come into the world with a twisted body and a brute intelligence. This had constituted the clay of him, and it had not been kindly molded by the world. White Fang knew why he was being beaten. When Grey Beaver tied the thong around his neck and passed the end of the thong into Beauty Smith's keeping, White Fang knew that it was his God's will for him to go with Beauty Smith. And when Beauty Smith left him tied outside the fort, he knew that it was Beauty Smith's will that he should remain there. Therefore, he had disobeyed the will of both the gods, and earned the consequent punishment. He had seen dogs change owners in the past, and he had seen the runaways beaten, as he was being beaten. He was wise, and yet in the nature of him there were forces greater than wisdom. One of these was fidelity. He did not love Great Beaver, yet, even in the face of his will and his anger, he was faithful to him. He could not help it. This faithfulness was a quality of the clay that composed him. It was the quality that was peculiarly the possession of his kind. The quality that set apart his species from all the other species. The quality that has enabled the wolf and the wild dog to come in from the open and be the companions of man. After the beating, White Fang was dragged back to the fort. But this time, Beauty Smith left him tied with a stick. One does not give up a god easily, and so with White Fang. Grey Beaver was his own particular god, and in spite of Grey Beaver's will, White Fang still clung to him and would not give him up. Grey Beaver had betrayed and forsaken him, but that had no effect upon him. Not for nothing had he surrendered himself, body and soul, to Grey Beaver. There had been no reservation on White Fang's part and the bond was not to be broken easily. So, in the night, when the man in the fort were asleep, White Fang applied his teeth to the stick that held him. The wood was seasoned and dry, and it was tied so closely to his neck that he could scarcely get his teeth to it. It was only by the severest muscular exertion and neck arching that he succeeded in getting the wood between his teeth, and barely between his teeth at that. And it was only by the exercise of an immense patience, extending through many hours, that he succeeded in gnawing through the stick. And this was something that dogs were not supposed to do. It was unprecedented, but White Fang did it, trotting away from the fort in the early morning, with the end of the stick hanging to his neck. He was wise, but had he been merely wise, he would not have come back to Grey Beaver, who had already twice betrayed him. But there was his faithfulness, and he went back to be betrayed yet a third time. Again he yielded to the tying of a thong around the neck by Grey Beaver, and again Beauty Smith came to claim him. And this time he was beaten even more severely than before. Grey Beaver looked on stolidly while the white man wielded the whip. He gave no protection, 
it was no longer his dog. When the beating was over, White Fang was sick. A soft Southland dog would have died under it, but not he. His school of life had been sterner, and he was himself of sterner stuff. He had too great vitality. His clutch on life was too strong. But he was very sick. At first he was unable to drag himself along, and Beauty Smith had to wait half an hour for him. And then, blind and reeling, he followed at Beauty Smith's heels back to the fort. But now he was tied with a chain that defied his teeth, and he strove in vain by lunging to draw the staple from the timber into which it was driven. After a few days, sober and bankrupt, Grey Beaver departed up the Porcupine on his long journey to the Mackenzie. White Fang remained on the Yukon, the property of a man more than half mad and all brute. But what is a dog to know in its consciousness of madness? To White Fang, Beauty Smith was a veritable, if terrible, god. He was a mad god at best, but White Fang knew nothing of madness. He knew only that he must submit to the will of this new master, obey his every whim and fancy. Chapter 3 The Reign of Hate under the tutelage of the mad god, White Fang became a fiend. He was kept chained in a pen at the rear of the fort. And here, Beauty Smith teased and irritated and drove him wild with petty torments. The man early discovered White Fang's susceptibility to laughter and made it a point after painfully tricking him to laugh at him. This laughter was uproarious and scornful, and at the same time the god pointed his finger derisively at White Fang. At such times reason fled from White Fang, and in his transports of rage he was even more mad than Beauty Smith. Formerly White Fang had been merely the enemy of his kind, with all a ferocious enemy. He now became the enemy of all things, and more ferocious than ever. To such an extent was he tormented that he hated blindly and without the faintest spark of reason. He hated the chain that bound him, the man who peered in at him through the slats of the pen, the dogs that accompanied the man and that snarled malignantly at him, in his helplessness. He hated the very wood of the pen that confined him. And first, last, and most of all, he hated Beauty Smith. But Beauty Smith had a purpose in all that he did to White Fang. One day, a number of men gathered around the pen. Beauty Smith entered, club in hand and took the chain off from White Fang's neck. When his master had gone out, White Fang turned loose and tore around the pen, trying to get at the man outside. He was magnificently terrible, fully five feet in length and standing two and one half feet at the shoulder. He far outweighed a wolf of corresponding size. From his mother he had inherited the heavier proportions of the dog, so that he weighed without any fat and without an ounce of superfluous flesh, over ninety pounds. It was all muscle, bone and sinew fighting flesh in the finest condition. The door of the pen was being opened again. White Fang paused 
Something unusual was happening. He waited. The door was opened wider. Then a huge dog was thrust inside, and the door was slammed shut behind him. White Fang had never seen such a dog. It was a mastiff, but the size and fierce aspect of the intruder did not deter him. Here was something, not wood nor iron, upon which to wreak his hate. He leaped in with a flash of fangs that ripped down the side of the mastiff's neck. The mastiff shook his head, growled hoarsely and plunged at White Fang. But White Fang was here, there, and everywhere, always evading and eluding, and always leaping in and slashing with his fangs, and leaping out again in time to escape punishment. The man outside shouted and applauded, while Beauty Smith, in an ecstasy of delight, gloated over the ripping and mangling performed by White Fang. There was no hope for the Mastiff from the first. He was too ponderous and slow. In the end, while Beauty Smith beat White Fang back with the club, the Mastiff was dragged out by its owner. Then there was a payment of bets, and money clinked in Beauty Smith's hand. White Fang came to look forward eagerly to the gathering of men around his pen. It meant a fight, and this was the only way that was now vouchsafed him of expressing the life that was in him. Tormented, incited to hate, he was kept a prisoner, so that there was no way of satisfying that hate, except at the times his master saw fit to put another dog against him. Beauty Smith had estimated his powers well, for he was invariably the victor. One day, three dogs were turned in upon him in succession. Another day, a full-grown wolf, fresh caught from the wild, was shoved in through the door of the pen. And on still another day, two dogs were set against him at the same time. This was his severest fight, and though in the end he killed them both, he was himself half killed in doing it. In the fall of the year, when the first snows were falling and Mush Eyes was running in the river, Beauty Smith took passage for himself and White Fang on a steamboat, bound up the Yukon to Dawson. White Fang had now achieved a reputation in the land. As the Fighting Wolf, he was known far and wide, and the cage in which he was kept on the steamboat's deck was usually surrounded by curious men. He raged and snarled at them, or lay quietly and studied them with cold hatred. Why should he not hate them? He never asked himself the question. He knew only hate, and lost himself in the passion of it. Life had become a hell to him. He had not been made for the close confinement wild beasts endure at the hands of men. And yet it was in precisely this way that he was treated. Men stared at him, poked sticks between the bars to make him snarl, and then laughed at him. They were his environment, these men, and they were molding the clay of him into a more ferocious thing than had been intended by nature. Nevertheless, nature had given him plasticity, where many another animal would have died or had its spirit broken. He adjusted himself and lived, and at no expense of the spirit. Possibly Beauty Smith, archfiend and tormentor, was capable of breaking White Fang's spirit, but as yet there were no signs of his succeeding. If Beauty Smith had in him a devil, White Fang had another, 
and the two of them raged against each other unceasingly. In the days before, White Fang had had the wisdom to cower down and submit to a man with a club in his hand. But this wisdom now left him. The mere sight of Beauty Smith was sufficient to send him into transports of fury. And when they came to close quarters, and he had been beaten back by the club, he went on growling and snarling and showing his fangs. The last growl could never be extracted from him. No matter how terribly he was beaten, he had always another growl. And when Beauty Smith gave up and withdrew, the defiant growl followed after him. Her white thing sprang at the bars of the cage, bellowing his hatred. When the steamboat arrived at Dawson, White Fang went ashore. But he still lived a public life in a cage, surrounded by curious men. He was exhibited as the fighting wolf, and the man paid fifty cents in gold dust to see him. He was given no rest. Did he lie down to sleep, he was stirred up by a sharp stick, so that the audience might get its money's worth. In order to make the exhibition interesting, he was kept in a rage most of the time. But worse than all this was the atmosphere in which he lived. He was regarded as the most fearful of wild beasts, and this was borne into him through the bars of the cage. Every word, every cautious action on the part of the man impressed upon him his own terrible ferocity. It was so much added fuel to the flame of his fierceness. There could be but one result, and that was that his ferocity fed upon itself and increased. It was another instance of the plasticity of his clay, of his capacity for being molded by the pressure of environment. In addition to being exhibited, he was a professional fighting animal. At irregular intervals, whenever a fight could be arranged, he was taken out of his cage and led off into the woods a few miles from town. Usually this occurred at night, so as to avoid interference from the mounted police of the territory. After a few hours of waiting, when daylight had come, the audience and the dog with which he was to fight arrived. In this manner it came about that he fought all sizes and breeds of dogs. It was a savage land, and the men were savage, and the fights were usually to the death. Since White Fang continued to fight, it is obvious that it was the other dogs that died. He never knew defeat. His early training, when he fought with Lip Lip, and the whole puppy pack stood him in good stead. There was the tenacity with which he clung to the earth. No dog could make him lose his footing. This was the favorite trick of the wolf breeds, to rush in upon him either directly or with an unexpected swerve, in the hope of striking his shoulder and overthrowing him. Mackenzie hounds, Eskimo and Labrador dogs, huskies and Malamutes. All tried it on him, and all failed. He was never known to lose his footing. Men told this to one another, and looked each time to see it happen, but White Fang always disappointed them. Then there was his lightning quickness. It gave him a tremendous advantage over his antagonists. No matter what their fighting experience, they had never encountered a dog that moved so swiftly as he. Also to be reckoned with was the immediateness of his attack. The average dog was accustomed to the preliminaries of snarling and bristling and growling. 
and the average dog was knocked off his feet and finished before he had begun to fight or recovered from his surprise. So often did this happen that it became the custom to hold White Fang until the other dog went through its preliminaries, was good and ready, and even made the first attack. But greatest of all the advantages in White Fang's favor was his experience. He knew more about fighting than did any of the dogs that faced him. He had fought more fights, knew how to meet more tricks and methods, and had more tricks himself, while his own method was scarcely to be improved upon. As the time went by, he had fewer and fewer fights. Men despaired of matching him with an equal, and Beauty Smith was compelled to pit wolves against him. These were trapped by the Indians for the purpose, and the fight between White Fang and the wolf was always sure to draw a crowd. Once a full-grown female lynx was secured, and this time White Fang fought for his life. Her quickness matched his, her ferocity equaled his, while he fought with his fangs alone, and she fought with her sharp clawed feet as well. But after the lynx, all fighting ceased for White Fang. There were no more animals with which to fight. At least there was none considered worthy of fighting with him. So he remained on exhibition until spring, when one Tim Keenan, a pharaoh dealer, arrived in the land. With him came the first bulldog that had ever entered the Klondike. That this dog and White Fang should come together was inevitable. And for a week the anticipated fight was the mainspring of conversation in certain quarters of town. Chapter 4 on The Clinging Death Beauty Smith slipped the chain from his neck and stepped back. For once, White Fang did not make an immediate attack. He stood still, ears pricked forward, alert and curious. Surveying the strange animal that faced him. He had never seen such a dog before. Tim Keenan shoved the bulldog forward with a muttered, Go to it. The animal waddled towards the center of the circle, short and squat and ungainly. He came to a stop and blinked across at White Fang. There were cries from the crowd of, Go to him, Cherokee. Sick him, Cherokee. Eat him up. But Cherokee did not seem anxious to fight. He turned his head and blinked at the man who shouted. At the same time, wagging his stump of a tail good-naturedly. He was not afraid, but merely lazy. Besides, it did not seem to him that it was intended he should fight with the dog he saw before him. He was not used to fighting with that kind of dog, and he was waiting for them to bring on the real dog. Tim Keenan stepped in and bent over Cherokee fondling him on both sides of the shoulders with hands that rub against the grain of the hair and that made slight, pushing forward movements. These were so many suggestions. Also, their effect was irritating for Cherokee began to growl very softly deep down in his throat. There was a correspondence in the rhythm between the growls and the movements of the man's hands. The growl rose in the throat with the culmination of each forward-pushing movement, and ebbed down to start up afresh with the beginning of the next movement. 
The end of each movement was the accent of the rhythm, the movement ending abruptly, and the growling arising with a jerk. This was not without its effect on White Fang. The hair began to rise on his neck and across the shoulders. Tim Keenan gave a final shove forward and stepped back again. As the impetus that carried Cherokee forward tied down, he continued to go forward of his own volition. In a swift, bow-legged run, then a white fang struck. A cry of startled admiration went up. He had covered the distance and gone in more like a cat than a dog, and with the same cat-like swiftness he had slashed with his fangs and leaped clear. The bulldog was bleeding back of one ear from a rip in his thick neck. He gave no sign, did not even snarl, but turned and followed after White Fang. The display on both sides, the quickness of the one and the steadiness of the other, had excited the partisan spirit of the crowd and the men were making new bets and increasing original bets. Again and yet again White Fang sprang in, slashed and got away untouched, and still his strange foe followed after him. Without too great haste, not slowly, but deliberately and determinedly, in a businesslike sort of way. There was purpose in his method, Something for him to do that he was intent upon doing, and from which nothing could distract him. His whole demeanor, every action, was stamped with this purpose. It puzzled White Fang. Never had he seen such a dog. It had no hair protection. It was soft and bled easily. There was no thick mat of fur to baffle White Fang's teeth as they were often baffled by dogs of his own breed. Each time that his teeth struck, they sank easily into the yielding flesh, while the animal did not seem able to defend itself. Another disconcerting thing was that it made no outcry, such as he had been accustomed to with the other dogs he had fought. Beyond a growl or a grunt, the dog took its punishment silently, and never did it flag in its pursuit of him. Not that Cherokee was slow, he could turn and whirl swiftly enough, but White Fang was never there. Cherokee was puzzled too. He had never fought before with a dog with which he could not close. The desire to close had always been mutual. But here was a dog that kept at a distance, dancing and dodging here and there and all about. And when it did get its teeth into him, it did not hold on, but let go instantly and darted away again. But White Fang could not get at the soft underside of the throat. The bulldog stood too short, while its massive jaws were an added protection. White Fang darted in and out unscathed, while Cherokee's wounds increased. Both sides of his neck and head were ripped and slashed. He bled freely, but showed no signs of being disconcerted. He continued his plodding pursuit, though once, for the moment baffled, he came to a full stop and blinked at the men who looked on at the same time wagging his stump of a tail as an expression of his willingness to fight. In that moment, White Fang was in upon him and out, in passing ripping his trimmed remnant of an ear. With a slight manifestation of anger, Cherokee took up the pursuit again, running on the inside of the circle White Fang was making and striving to fasten his deadly grip on White Fang's throat. The bulldog missed by a hair's breadth, and cries of praise went up as White Fang doubled suddenly out of danger in the opposite direction. And the time went by. White Fang still danced on, dodging and doubling, 
leaping in and out and ever inflicting damage. And still the bulldog, with grim certitude, toiled after him. Sooner or later he would accomplish his purpose, get the grip that would win the battle. In the meantime he accepted all the punishment the other could deal him. His tufts of ears had become tassels, his neck and shoulders were slashed in a score of places, and his very lips were cut and bleeding, all from these lightning snaps that were beyond his foreseeing and guarding. Time and again White Fang had attempted to knock Cherokee off his feet, but the difference in their height was too great. Cherokee was too squat, too close to the ground. White Fang tried the trick once too often. The chance came in one of his quick doublings and counter-circlings. He caught Cherokee with head turned away as he whirled more slowly. His shoulder was exposed. White Fang drove in upon it, but his own shoulder was high above while he struck with such force that his momentum carried him on across over the other's body. For the first time in his fighting history, man saw White Fang lose his footing. His body turned a half somersault in the air, and he would have landed on his back had he not twisted, cat-like, still in the air, in the effort to bring his feet to the earth. As it was, he struck heavily on his side. The next instant he was on his feet, but in that instant Cherokee's teeth closed on his throat. It was not a good grip, being too low down towards the chest, but Cherokee held on. White Fang sprang to his feet and tore wildly around, trying to shake off the bulldog's body. It made him frantic, this clinging, dragging weight. It bound his movements, restricted his freedom. It was like the trap, and all his instinct resented it and revolted against it. It was a mad revolt. For several minutes he was, to all intents, insane. The basic life that was in him took charge of him. The will to exist of his body surged over him. He was dominated by this mere flesh love of life. All intelligence was gone. It was as though he had no brain. His reason was unseated by the blind yearning of the flesh to exist and move. At all hazards to move, to continue to move, for movement was the expression of its existence. Round and round he went, whirling and turning and traversing, trying to shake off the fifty-pound weight that dragged at his throat. The bulldog did little but keep his grip. Sometimes and rarely he managed to get his feet to the earth and for a moment to brace himself against White Fang. But the next moment his footing would be lost and he would be dragging around in the whirl of one of White Fang's mad gyrations. Cherokee identified himself with his instinct. He knew that he was doing the right thing by holding on, and there came to him certain blissful thrills of satisfaction. At such moments he even closed his eyes and allowed his body to be hurled hither and thither, willy-nilly, careless of any hurt that might thereby come to it. That did not count. The grip was the thing, and the grip he kept. White Fang seized only when he had tired himself out. He could do nothing, and he could not understand. Never in all his fighting had this thing happened. The dogs he had fought with did not fight that way. With them it was snap and slash and get away. Snap and slash and get away. He lay partly on his side, panting for breath. Cherokee still holding his grip, urged against him. 
trying to get him over entirely on his side. White Fang resisted and he could feel the jaws shifting their grip, slightly relaxing and coming together again in a chewing movement. Each shift brought the grip closer to his throat. The bulldog's method was to hold what he had, and when opportunity favored, to work in for more. Opportunity favored when White Fang remained quiet. When White Fang struggled, Cherokee was content merely to hold on. The bulging back of Cherokee's neck was the only portion of his body that White Fang's teeth could not reach. He got hold towards the base where the neck comes out from the shoulders. But he did not know the chewing method of fighting, nor were his jaws adapted to it. He spasmodically ripped and tore with his fangs for a space. Then a change in their position diverted him. The bulldog had managed to roll him over on his back, and still hanging on to his throat was on top of him. Like a cat, White Fang bowed his hindquarters in. With his feet digging into his enemy's abdomen above him, he began to claw with long tearing strokes. Cherokee might well have been disemboweled had he not quickly pivoted on his grip and got his body off of White Fangs and at right angles to it. And there was no escaping that grip. It was like fate itself, and as inexorable. Slowly it shifted up along the jugular. All that saved White Fang from death was the loose skin of his neck and the thick fur that covered it. This served to form a large roll in Cherokee's mouth, the fur of which well nigh defied his teeth. But bit by bit, whenever the chance offered, he was getting more of the loose skin and fur in his mouth. The result was that he was slowly throttling White Fang. The latter's breath was drawn with greater and greater difficulty as the moments went by. It began to look as though the battle were over. The backers of Cherokee waxed jubilant and offered ridiculous odds, while Fang's backers were correspondingly depressed and refused bets of 10 to 1 and 20 to 1, so one man was rash enough to close a wager of 50 to 1. This man was Beauty Smith. He took a step into the ring and pointed his finger at White Fang. Then he began to laugh derisively and scornfully. This produced the desired effect. White Fang went wild with rage. He called up his reserves of strength and gained his feet. As he struggled around the ring, the fifty pounds of his foe ever dragging on his throat, his anger passed on into panic. The basic life of him dominated him again, and his intelligence fled before the will of his flesh to live. Round and round and back again, stumbling and falling and rising, even uprearing at times on his hind legs and lifting his foe clear of the earth. He struggled vainly to shake off the clinging death. At last he fell, toppling backward, exhausted. And the bulldog promptly shifted his grip, getting in closer, mangling more and more of the fur-folded flesh throttling Wild Fang more severely than ever. Shouts of applause went up for the victor, and there were many cries of Cherokee, Cherokee. To this, Cherokee responded by vigorous wagging of the stump of his tail. But the clamor of approval did not distract him. There was no sympathetic relation between his tail and his massive jaws. The one might wag, but the other held a terrible grip on White Fang's throat. 
It was at this time that a diversion came to the spectators. And there was a jingle of bells. Dark Musha's cries were heard. Everybody, save Beauty Smith, looked apprehensively. The fear of the police was strong upon them. But they saw, up the trail, and not down, two men running with sled and dogs. They were evidently coming down the creek from some prospecting trip. At sight of the crowd, they stopped the dogs and came over and joined in, curious to see the cause of the excitement. The dog musher wore a mustache, but the other, a taller and younger man, was smooth shaven, his skin rosy from the pounding of his blood and the running in the frosty air. White Fang had practically ceased struggling. Now and again he resisted spasmodically, and to no purpose. He could get a little air, and that little grew less and less, under the merciless grip that ever tightened. In spite of his armor of fur, the great vein of his throat would have long since been torn open had not the first grip of the bulldog been so low down as to be practically on the chest. It had taken Cherokee a long time to shift that grip upward, and this had also tended further to clog his jaws with fur and skin fold. In the meantime, the abysmal brute in Beauty Smith had been rising into his brain and mastering the small bit of sanity that he possessed at best. When he saw White Fang's eyes beginning to glaze, he knew beyond doubt that the fight was lost. Then he broke loose. He sprang upon White Fang and began savagely to kick him. There were hisses from the crowd and cries of protest, but that was all. While this went on, and Beauty Smith continued to kick White Fang, there was a commotion in the crowd. The tall, young newcomer was forcing his way through, shouldering men right and left, without ceremony or gentleness. When he broke through into the ring, Beauty Smith was just in the act of delivering another kick. All his weight was on one foot, and he was in a state of unstable equilibrium. At that moment, the newcomer's fist landed a smashing blow full in his face. Beauty Smith's remaining leg left the ground, and his whole body seemed to lift into the air as he turned over backward and struck the snow. The newcomer turned upon the crowd. You cowards, he cried. You beasts. He was in a rage himself. A sane rage. His gray eyes seemed metallic and steel-like as they flashed upon the crowd. Beauty Smith regained his feet and came toward him, sniffling and cowardly. The newcomer did not understand. He did not know how abject a coward the other was, and thought he was coming back intent on fighting. So with a you beast, he smashed Beauty Smith over backwards with a second blow on the face. Beauty Smith decided that the snow was the safest place for him, and lay where he had fallen, making no effort to get up. Come on, Matt, lend a hand, the newcomer called the dog musher, who had followed him into the ring. Both men bent over the dogs. Matt took hold of White Fang, ready to pull when Cherokee's jaws should be loosened. This the younger man endeavored to accomplish by clutching the bulldog's jaws in his hands and trying to spread them. It was a vain undertaking. As he pulled and tugged and wrenched, he kept exclaiming with every expulsion of breath, Beasts! The crowd began to grow unruly, and some of the men were protesting against the spoiling of the sport. 
but they were silenced when the newcomer lifted his head from his work for a moment and glared at them. You damn beasts, he finally exploded and went back to his task. It's no use, Mr. Scott, you can't break him apart that way, Matt said at last. The pair paused and surveyed the locked dogs. Ain't bleeding much, Matt announced. Ain't got all the way in yet. But he's liable to any moment, Scott answered. There, did you see that? He shifted his grip in a bit. The younger man's excitement and apprehension for White Fang was growing. He struck Cherokee about the head savagely again and again, but that did not loosen the jaws. Cherokee wagged the stump of his tail in advertisement that he understood the meaning of the blows, but that he knew he was himself in the right and only doing his duty by keeping his grip. Won't some of you help? Scott cried desperately at the crowd, but no help was offered. Instead, the crowd began sarcastically to cheer him on and showered him with facious advice. You'll have to get a pry, Matt counseled. The other reached into the holster at his hip, drew his revolver, and tried to thrust its muzzle between the bulldog's jaws. He shoved and shoved hard, till the grating of the steel against the locked teeth could be distinctly heard. Both men were on their knees, bending over the dogs. Tim Keenan strode into the ring. He paused beside Scott and touched him on the shoulder, saying ominously, Don't break them teeth, stranger. Then I'll break his neck, Scott retorted, continuing his shoving and wedging with the revolver muscle. I said, don't break them teeth, the pharaoh dealer repeated more ominously than before. But if it was a bluff he intended, it did not work. Scott never desisted from his efforts, though he looked up coolly and asked, You a dog? The pharaoh dealer grunted. Then get in here and break this grip. Well, stranger, the other drawled irritatingly, I don't mind telling you that's something I ain't worked out for myself. I don't know how to turn the trick. Then get out of the way, was the reply, and don't bother me, I'm busy. Tim Keenan continued standing over him, but Scott took no further notice of his presence. He had managed to get the muzzle in between the jaws on one side and was trying to get it out between the jaws on the other side. This accomplished, he pried gently and carefully, loosening the jaws a bit at a time, while Matt, a bit at a time, extricated White Fang's mangled neck. Stand by to receive your dog, was God's peremptory order to Cherokee's owner. The pharaoh dealer stooped down obediently and got a firm hold on Cherokee. Now, Scott warned, giving the final pry. The dogs were drawn apart, the bulldog struggling vigorously. Take him away, Scott commanded, and Tim Keenan dragged Cherokee back into the crowd. White Fang made several ineffectual efforts to get up. Once he gained his feet, but his legs were too weak to sustain him, and he slowly wilted and sank back into the snow. His eyes were half closed, and the surface of them was glassy. His jaws were apart, and through them the tongue protruded, draggled and limp. To all appearances, he looked like a dog that had been strangled to death. Matt examined him. Just about all in, he announced. But he's breathing all right. Beauty Smith had regained his feet and come over to look at White Fang. Matt, how much is a good sled dog worth? Scott asked. The dog musher, 
still on his knees and stooped over White Fang, calculated for a moment. Three hundred dollars, he answered. And how much for one that's all chewed up like this one? Scott asked, nudging White Fang with his foot. Half of that was the dog musher's judgment. Scott turned upon Beauty Smith. Did you hear, Mr. Beast? I'm going to take your dog from you. And I'm going to give you a hundred and fifty for him. He opened his pocketbook and counted out the bills. Beauty Smith put his hands behind his back, refusing to touch the profit money. I ain't a sellin', he said. Oh, yes, you are, the other assured him. Because I'm buying. Here's your money. The dog's mine. Beauty Smith, his hands still behind him, began to back away. Scott sprang toward him, drawing his fist back to strike. Beauty Smith cowered down in anticipation of the blow. I've got my rights, he whimpered. You forfeit your rights to own that dog, was the rejoinder. Are you going to take the money, or do I have to hit you again? All right, Beauty Smith spoke up with the alacrity of fear. But I take the money on the protest, he added. The dogs are mint. I ain't going to be robbed. A man's got his rights. Correct, Scott answered, passing the money over to him. A man's got his rights, but you're not a man. You're a beast. Wait till I get back to Dawson. Beauty Smith threatened. I'll have to law on you. If you open your mouth when you get back to Dawson, I'll have you run out of town. Understand? Beauty Smith replied with a grunt. Understand? The other thundered with abrupt fierceness. Yes, Beauty Smith grunted, shrinking away. Yes, what? Yes, sir, Beauty Smith snarled. Look out, he'll bite, someone shouted, and the guffaw of laughter went up. Scott turned his back on him and returned to help the dog musher, who was working over White Fang. Some of the men were already departing. Others stood in groups, looking on and talking. Tim Keenan joined one of the groups. Who's that mug? he asked. Whedon Scott, someone answered. And who in hell is Whedon Scott? The Pharaoh dealer demanded. Oh, one of them crackerjack mining experts. He's in with all the big bugs. If you want to keep out of trouble, you'll still clear of him. That's my talk. He's all hunky with the officials. The Gold Commission has a special pal of his. I thought he must be somebody, was the Pharaoh dealer's comment. That's why I kept my hands off him at the start. Chapter 5 The Indomitable It's hopeless, Whedon Scott confessed. He sat on the step of his cabin and stared at the dog musher, who responded with a shrug that was equally hopeless. Together they looked at White Fang at the end of his stretched chain, bristling, snarling, ferocious straining to get at the sled dogs. Having received sundry lessons from Matt, said lessons being imparted by means of a club, the sled dogs had learned to leave White Fang alone. And even then they were lying down at a distance, apparently oblivious of his existence. It's a wolf and there's no tame in it, Whedon Scott announced. Oh, I don't know about that, Matt objected. Might be a lot of dog in him, for all you can tell. But there's one thing I know sure, and that there's no getting away from. The dog musher paused and nodded his head confidentially at Moosehide Mountain. Well, don't be a miser with what you know, 
Scott said sharply, after waiting a suitable length of time. Spit it out. What is it? What is it? The dog musher indicated White Fang with a backward thrust of his thumb. A wolf a dog, it's all the same. He's been tamed already. No, I tell you yes. And broke to harness. Look close there. Do you see the marks across the chest? You're right, Matt. He was a sled dog before Billy Smith got hold of him. And there's not much reason against his being a sled dog again. What you think? Scott queried eagerly. Then the hope died down as he added, shaking his head. We've had him two weeks now, and if anything, he's wilder than ever at the present moment. Give him a chance, Matt counseled. Turn him loose for a spell. The other looked at him incredulously. Yes, Matt went on. I know you've tried to, but you didn't take a club. You tried then. The dark musher secured the club and went over to the chained animal. White Fang watched the club after the manner of a caged lion watching the whip of its trainer. See him keep his eye on the club, Matt said. That's a good sign. He's no fool. Don't dash tackle me so long as I got that club handy. He's not clean crazy, sure. As the man's hand approached his neck, White Fang bristled and snarled and crouched down. But while he eyed the approaching hand, he at the same time contrived to keep track of the club in the other hand, suspended threateningly above him. Matt unsnapped the chain from the collar and stepped back. White Fang could scarcely realize that he was free. Many months had gone by since he passed into the possessions of Billy Smith, and in all that period he had never known a moment of freedom, except at the times he had been loosed to fight with other dogs. Immediately after such fights he had always been imprisoned again. He did not know what to make of it. Perhaps some new devilry of the gods was about to be perpetrated on him. He walked slowly and cautiously, prepared to be assailed at any moment. He did not know what to do. It was all so unprecedented. He took the precaution to sheer off from the two watching guards and walked carefully to the corner of the cabin. Nothing happened. He was plainly perplexed and he came back again pausing a dozen feet away and regarding the two men intently. Won't he run away? His new honor asked. Matt shrugged his shoulders. Got to take a gamble. Only way to find out is to find out. Poor devil, Scott murmured pityingly. What he needs is some show of human kindness, he added, turning and going into the cabin. He came out with a piece of meat, which he tossed to White Fang. He sprang away from it, and from a distance studied it suspiciously. Hey you, Major, Matt shouted warningly, but too late. Major had made a spring for the meat. At the instant his jaws closed on it, White Fang struck him. He was overthrown. Matt rushed in, but quicker than he was White Fang. Major staggered to his feet, but the blood spouting from his throat reddened the snow in a widening path. It's too bad, but it served him right, Scott said hastily. But Matt's foot had already started on its way to kick White Fang. There was a leap, a flash of teeth, a sharp exclamation. White Fang, snarling fiercely, scrambled backward for several yards, while Matt stooped and investigated his leg. He got me all right, he announced, pointing to the torn trousers and underclothes, and the growing stain of red. I told you it was hopeless, Matt, Scott said in a discouraged voice. 
I've thought about it off and on while not wanting to think of it, but we've come to it now. It's the only thing to do. As he talked, with reluctant movements, he drew his revolver, threw open the cylinder, and assured himself of its contents. Look here, Mr. Scott, Matt objected. That dog's been through hell. You can't expect him to come out a white and shining angel. Give him time. Look at Major, the other recalled. The dog mushers surveyed the stricken dog. He had sunk down on the snow in a circle of his blood and was plainly in the last gasp. Served him right, he said to yourself, Mr. Scott. He tried to take White Fang's meat, and he's dead o. That was to be expected. I wouldn't give two whoops in hell for a dog that wouldn't fight for his own meat. But look at yourself, Matt. It's all right about the dogs, but we must draw the line somewhere. Served me right, Matt argued stubbornly. What do I want to kick him for? He said yourself that he'd done right. Then I had no right to kick him. It would be a mercy to kill him, Scott insisted. He's untamable. Now look here, Mr. Scott. Give the poor devil a fighting chance. He ain't had no chance yet. He's just come through hell. And this is the first time he's been loose. Give him a fair chance. And if he don't deliver the goods, I'll kill him myself. There. God knows I don't want to kill him or have him killed, Scott answered, putting away the revolver. Well, we'll let him run loose and see what kindness can do for him. And here's a try at it. He walked over to White Fang and began talking to him gently and soothingly. Better have a club handy, Matt warned. Scott shook his head and went on trying to win White Fang's confidence. White Fang was suspicious. Something was impending. He had killed this god's dog, bitten his companion god, and what else was to be expected than some terrible punishment? But in the face of it, he was indomitable. He bristled and showed his teeth, his eyes vigilant, his whole body wary and prepared for anything. The god had no club, so he suffered him to approach quite near. The god's hand had come out and was descending upon his head, White Fang shrank together and grew tense as he crouched under it. Here was danger, some treachery or something. He knew the hands of the gods, their proved mastery, their cunning to hurt. Besides, there was his old antipathy to being touched. He snarled more menacingly, crouched still lower, and still the hand descended. He did not want to bite the hand, and he endured the peril of it until his instinct surged up in him, mastering him with its insatiable yearning for life. Whedon Scott had believed that he was quick enough to avoid any snap or slash, but he had yet to learn the remarkable quickness of White Fang who struck with the certainty and swiftness of a coiled snake. Scott cried out sharply with surprise, catching his torn hand and holding it tightly in his other. Matt uttered a great oath and sprang to his side. White Fang crouched down and backed away, bristling, showing his fangs, his eyes malignant with menace. Now he could expect a beating as fearful as any he had received from Beauty Smith. Here, what are you doing? Scott cried suddenly. Matt had dashed into the cabin and come out with a rifle. Nothing, he said slowly with a careless calmness that was assumed. Only go on to keep that promise I made. I reckon it's up to me to kill him, as I said I'd do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Watch me. 
As Matt had pleaded for White Fang when he had been bitten, it was now Whedon Scott's turn to plead. He said to give him a chance. Well, give it to him. We've only just started, and we can't quit at the beginning. It served me right this time, and look at him. White Fang, near the corner of the cabin and forty feet away, or snarling with blood-curdling viciousness, not at Scott, but at the dog musher. Well, I'll be everlastingly gush, woggled, was the dog musher's expression of astonishment. Look at the intelligence of him, Scott went on hastily. He knows the meaning of firearms as well as you do. He's got intelligence, and we've got to give that intelligence a chance. Put up the gun. All right, I'm willing, Matt agreed, leaning the rifle against the woodpile. But will you look at that, he exclaimed the next moment. White Fang had quieted down and ceased snarling. This is worth investigating. Watch. Matt reached for the rifle, and at the same moment, White Fang snarled. He stepped away from the rifle, and White Fang's lifted lips descended, covering his teeth. Now, just for fun, Matt took the rifle and began slowly to raise it to his shoulder. White Fang's snarling began with the movement, and increased as the movement approached its culmination. But the moment before the rifle came to a level on him, he leaped sideways behind the corner of the cabin. Matt stood staring along the sights at the empty space of snow which had been occupied by White Fang. The dog musher put the rifle down solemnly, then turned and looked at his employer. I agree with you, Mr. Scott. That dog's too intelligent to kill. Chapter 6 The Love Master As White Fang watched Reed and Scott approach, he bristled and snarled to advertise that he would not submit to punishment. Twenty-four hours had passed since he had slashed open the hand that was now bandaged and held up by a sling to keep the blood out of it. In the past, White Fang had experienced delayed punishment, and he apprehended that such a one was about to befall him. How could it be otherwise? He had committed what was to him sacrilege, sunk his fangs into the holy flesh of a god, and of a white-skinned superior god at that. In the nature of things, and of intercourse with gods, something terrible awaited them. The gods sat down several feet away. White Fang could see nothing dangerous in that. When the gods administered punishment, they stood on their legs. Besides, this god had no club, no whip, no firearm. And furthermore, he himself was free. No chain, no stick bound him. He could escape into safety while the god was scrambling to his feet. In the meantime, he would wait and see. The god remained quiet, made no movement, and White Fink's snarl slowly dwindled to a growl that ebbed down in his throat and ceased. Then the god spoke, and at the first sound of his voice, the hair rose on White Fink's neck and a growl rushed up his throat. But the god made no hostile movement, and went on calmly talking. For a time, White Fang growled in unison with him, a correspondence of rhythm being established between growl and voice. But the god talked on interminably. He talked to White Fang as White Fang had never been talked to before. He talked softly and soothingly, with a gentleness that somehow, somewhere, touched White Fang. In spite of himself and all the pricking warnings of his instinct, White Fang began to have confidence in this god, 
He had a feeling of security that was bellied by all his experience with men. After a long time, the guard got up and went into the cabin. White Fang scanned him apprehensively when he came out. He had neither whip, nor club, nor weapon. Nor was his uninjured hand behind his back, hiding something. He sat down as before in the same spot, several feet away. He held out a small piece of meat. White Fang pricked his ears and investigated it suspiciously, managing to look at the same time both at the meat and the guard, alert for any overt act, his body tense and ready to spring away at the first sign of hostility. Still, the punishment delayed. The guard merely held near to his nose a piece of meat, and about the meat there seemed nothing wrong. Still, White Fang suspected, and though the meat was proffered to him with short inviting thrusts of the hand, he refused to touch it. The guards were all wise, and there was no telling what masterful treachery lurked behind that apparent harmless piece of meat. In past experience, especially in dealing with squaws, meat and punishment had often been disastrously related. In the end, the guard tossed the meat on the snow at White Fang's feet. He smelt the meat carefully, but he did not look at it. And while he smelt it, he kept his eyes on the guard. Nothing happened. He took the meat into his mouth and swallowed it. Still, nothing happened. The guard was actually offering him another piece of meat. Again, he refused to take it from the hand, and again it was tossed to him. This was repeated a number of times. But there came a time when the guard refused to toss it. He kept it in his hand and steadfastly proffered it. The meat was good meat, and White Fang was hungry. Bit by bit, infinitely cautious, he approached the hand. At last the time came that he decided to eat the meat from the hand. He never took his eyes from the guard, thrusting his head forward with ears flattened back and hair involuntarily rising and cresting on his neck. Also, a low growl rumbled in his throat as a warning that he was not to be trifled with. He ate the meat, and nothing happened. Piece by piece, he ate all the meat, and nothing happened. Still, the punishment delayed. He licked his chops and waited. The guard went on talking, and his voice was kindness something of which White Fang had no experience whatever, and within him it aroused feelings which he had likewise never experienced before. He was aware of a certain strange satisfaction, as though some need were being gratified, as though some void in his being were being filled. Then again came the prod of his instinct and the warning of past experience. The gods were ever crafty, and they had unguessed ways of attaining their ends. Ah, he had thought so. There it came now, the god's hand, cunning to hurt, thrusting out at him, descending upon his head. But the god went on talking. His voice was soft and soothing. In spite of the menacing hand, the voice inspired confidence. And in spite of the assuring voice, the hand inspired distrust. White Fang was torn by conflicting feelings, impulses. It seemed he would fly to pieces, so terrible was the control he was exerting. Holding together by an unwanted indecision the counterforces that struggled within him for mastery, he compromised.
He snarled and bristled and flattened his ears, but he neither snapped nor sprang away. The hand descended. Nearer and nearer it came. It touched the ends of his upstanding hair. He shrank down under it. It followed down after him, pressing more closely against him, shrinking almost shivering. He still managed to hold himself together. It was a torment, this hand that touched him and violated his instinct. He could not forget in a day all the evil that had been wrought him at the hands of men. But it was the will of the god, and he strove to submit. The hand lifted and descended again in a padding, caressing movement. This continued, but every time the hand lifted, the hair lifted under it. And every time the hand descended, the ears flattened down, and a cavernous growl surged in his throat. White Fang growled and growled with insistent warning. By this means he announced that he was prepared to retaliate for any hurt he might receive. There was no telling when the god's ulterior motive might be disclosed. At any moment that soft, confidence-inspiring voice might break forth in a roar of wrath. That gentle and caressing hand transform itself into a vice-like grip to hold him helpless and administer punishment. But the god talked on softly, and ever the hand rose and fell with non-hostile pats. White Fang experienced dual feelings. It was distasteful to his instinct. It restrained him, opposed the will of him toward personal liberty. And yet it was not physically painful. On the contrary, it was even pleasant, in a physical way. The padding movement slowly and carefully changed to a rubbing of the ears about their bases. And the physical pleasure even increased a little. Yet he continued to fear and he stood on guard, expectant of unguessed evil, alternately suffering and enjoying, as one feeling or the other came uppermost and swayed him. Well, I'll be gosh swoggled, so spoke Matt, coming out of the cabin, his leaves rolled up. A pan of dirty dishwater in his hands, arrested in the act of emptying the pan by the sight of Wheaton Scott, patting White Fang. At the instant his voice broke the silence, White Fang leaped back, snarling savagely at him. Matt regarded his employer with grieved disapproval. If you don't mind my expressing my feelings, Mr. Scott, I'll make free to say you are seventeen kinds of a damn fool and all of them different and then some. Whedon Scott smiled with a superior air, gained his feet and walked over to White Fang. He talked soothingly to him, but not for long, then slowly put out his hand, rested it on White Fang's head, and resumed the interrupted padding. White Fang endured it, keeping his eyes fixed suspiciously, not upon the man that patted him, but upon the man that stood in the doorway. You may be a number one, tip-top mining expert, all right, all right. The dog must have delivered himself oracularly. But you missed the chance of your life when you was a boy and didn't run off and join a circus. White Fang snarled at the sound of his voice, but this time did not leap away from under the hand that was caressing his head and the back of his neck with long, soothing strokes. It was the beginning of the end for White Fang. The ending of the old life and the reign of hate. A new and incomprehensibly fair life was dawning. It required much thinking and endless patience on the part of Whedon Scott to accomplish this. 
and on the part of White Fang it required nothing less than a revolution. He had to ignore the urges and promptings of instinct and reason, defy experience, give the lie to life itself. Life as he had known it not only had had no place in it for much that he now did, but all the currents had gone counter to those to which he now abandoned himself. In short, when all things were considered, he had to achieve an orientation far faster than the one he had achieved at the time he came voluntarily in from the wild and accepted Grey Beaver as his lord. At that time he was a mere puppy, soft from the making, without form, ready for the thumb of circumstances to begin its work upon him. But now it was different. The thumb of circumstances had done its work only too well. By it he had been formed and hardened into the fighting wolf, fierce and implacable, unloving and unlovable. To accomplish the change was like a reflux of being. And this when the plasticity of youth was no longer his, and the fiber of him had become tough and knotty, when the warp of the wolf of him had made him an adamantine texture, harsh and unyielding, when the face of his spirit had become iron, and all his instincts and axioms had crystallized into set rules, cautions, dislikes and desires. Yet again, in this new orientation, it was the thumb of circumstances that pressed and prodded him, softening that which had become hard, and remolding it into fairer form. Whedon Scott was in truth this thumb. He had gone to the roots of White Fang's nature, and with kindness touched to life potencies that had languished and well nigh perished. One such potency was love. It took the place of like, which latter had been the highest feeling that thrilled him in his intercourse with the gods. But this love did not come in a day. It began with like, and out of it slowly developed. White Fang did not run away though he was allowed to be loose, because he liked this new god. This was certainly better than the life he had lived in the cage of Beauty Smith, and it was necessary that he should have some god. The lordship of man was a need of his nature. The seal of his dependence on man had been set upon him in that early day, when he turned his back on the wild and crawled to Grey Beaver's feet to receive the expected beating. The seal had been stamped upon him again, and ineradicably on his second return from the wild. When the long famine was over and there was fish once more in the village of Grey Beaver. And so, because he needed a god and because he preferred Whedon Scott to Beauty Smith, White Fang remained. In acknowledgement of fealty, he proceeded to take upon himself the guardianship of his master's property. He prowled about the cabin while the sled dog slept, and the first night visitor to the cabin fought him off with a club until Whedon Scott came to the rescue. But White Fang soon learned to differentiate between thieves and honest men, to appraise the true value of step and carriage. The man who traveled, loud stepping, the direct line to the cabin door, he let alone, though he watched him vigilantly until the door opened and he received the endorsement of the master. But the man who went softly by circuitous ways, peering with caution, seeking after secrecy. That was the man who received no suspension of judgment from White Fang, and who went away abruptly, hurriedly, and without dignity. Whedon Scott had set himself the task of redeeming White Fang, or rather, 
of redeeming mankind from the wrong it had done White Fang. It was a matter of principle and conscience. He felt that the ill done White Fang was a debt incurred by man, and that it must be paid. So he went out of his way to be especially kind to the fighting wolf. Each day he made it a point to caress and pet White Fang, and to do it at length. At first, suspicious and hostile, White Fang grew to like this petting, but there was one thing that he never outgrew, his growling. Growl he would, from the moment the petting began, till it ended. But it was a growl with a new note in it. A stranger could not hear this note, and to such a stranger the growling of White Fang was an exhibition of primordial savagery, nerve-wracking and blood-curdling. But White Fang's throat had become harsh-fibred from the making of ferocious sounds through the many years since his first little rasp of anger in the layer of his cupboard and he could not soften the sounds of that throat, now to express the gentleness he felt. Nevertheless, he read in Scott's ear and sympathy were fine enough to catch the new note, all but drowned in the fierceness. The note that was the faintest hint of a crone of content, and that none but he could hear. As the days went by, the evolution of like into love was accelerated. White Fink himself began to grow aware of it, though in his consciousness he knew not what love was. It manifested itself to him as a void in his being, a hungry, aching, yearning void that clamored to be felt. It was a pain and an unrest and it received easement only by the touch of the new god's presence. At such times love was joy to him, a wild, keen, thrilling satisfaction. But when away from his god, the pain and the unrest returned. The void in him sprang up and pressed against him with its emptiness, and the hunger gnawed and gnawed unceasingly. White Fang was in the process of finding himself. In spite of the majority of his years and of the savage rigidity of the mold that had formed him, his nature was undergoing an expansion. There was a burgeoning within him of strange feelings and unwanted impulses. His old code of conduct was changing. In the past he had liked comfort and surcease from pain disliked discomfort and pain, and he had adjusted his actions accordingly. But now it was different. Because of this new feeling within him, he oftentimes elected discomfort and pain for the sake of his God. Thus, in the early morning, instead of roaming and foraging, or lying in a sheltered nook, he would wait for hours on the cheerless cabin stoop for a sight of the god's face. At night, when the god returned home, White Fang would leave the warm sleeping place he had burrowed in the snow in order to receive the friendly snap of fingers and a word of greeting. Meat, even meat itself, he would forgo to be with his god. To receive a caress from him or to accompany him down into the town. Like had been replaced by love. And love was the plummet dropped down into the deeps of him where like had never gone. And responsive out of his deeps had come the new thing, love. That which was given upon him did he return. This was a god indeed, a love god, a warm and radiant god, in whose light White Fink's nature expanded as a flower expands under the sun. But White Fang was not demonstrative. He was too old, too firmly molded to become adept at expressing himself in new ways. 
He was too self-possessed, too strongly poised in his own isolation. Too long had he cultivated reticence, aloofness and moroseness. He had never barked in his life, and he could not now learn to bark a welcome when his god approached. He was never in the way, never extravagant, nor foolish in the expression of his love. He never ran to meet his god, he waited at a distance. But he always waited, was always there. His love partook of the nature of worship, dumb, inarticulate, a silent adoration. Only by the steady regard of his eyes did he express his love, and by the unceasing following with his eyes of his God's every movement. Also, at times, when his God looked at him and spoke to him, he betrayed an awkward self-consciousness, caused by the struggle of his love to express itself, and his physical inability to express it. He learned to adjust himself in many ways to his new mode of life. It was borne in upon him that he must let his master's dogs alone. Yet his dominant nature asserted itself, and he had first to thrash them into an acknowledgement of his superiority and leadership. This accomplished, he had little trouble with them. They gave trail to him when he came and went or walked among them, and when he asserted his will, they obeyed. In the same way, he came to tolerate Matt as a possession of his master. His master rarely fed him. Matt did that. It was his business. Yet White Fang divined that it was his master's food he ate and that it was his master who thus fed him vicariously. Matt it was who tried to put him into the harness and make him haul sled with the other dogs, but Matt failed. It was not until Weedon Scott put the harness on White Fang and worked him that he understood. He took it as his master's will that Matt should drive him, and work him just as he drove and worked his master's other dogs. Different from the Mackenzie toboggans were the Klondike sleds with runners under them, and different was the method of driving the dogs. There was no fan formation of the team. The dogs worked in single file, one behind another, hauling on double traces. And here in the Klondike, the leader was indeed the leader. The wisest as well as strongest dog was the leader, and the team obeyed him and feared him. That White Fang should quickly gain this post was inevitable. He could not be satisfied with less, as Matt learned after much inconvenience and trouble. White Fang picked out the post for himself and Matt backed his judgment with strong language after the experiment had been tried. But though he worked in the sled in the day, the White Fang did not forgo the guarding of his master's property at night. Thus he was on duty all the time, ever vigilant and faithful, the most valuable of all dogs. Make and free to spit out what's in me, Matt said one day, I beg to state that you was a wise guy all right when you paid the price you did for that dog. You clean swindled Beauty Smith on top of pushing his face in with your fist. A recrudescence of anger glinted in Weedon Scott's grey eyes, and he muttered savagely, The beast. In the late spring, a great trouble came to White Fang. Without warning, the love master disappeared. There had been warning, but White Fang was unversed in such things and did not understand the packing of a grip. He remembered afterwards that his packing had preceded the master's disappearance, but at the time he suspected nothing. That night he waited for the master to return. At midnight the chill wind that blew 
drove into shelter at the rear of the cabin. There he drowsed, only half asleep, his ears keyed for the first sound of the familiar step. But at two in the morning, his anxiety drove him out to the cold front stoop, where he crouched and waited. But no master came. In the morning, the door opened and Matt stepped outside. White Fang gazed at him wistfully. There was no common speech by which he might learn what he wanted to know. The days came and went, but never the master. White Fang, who had never known sickness in his life, became sick. He became very sick. So sick that Matt was finally compelled to bring him inside the cabin. Also, in writing to his employer, Matt devoted the postscript to White Fang. Reed and Scott, reading the letter down in Circle City, came upon the following. That damn wolf won't work, won't eat, ain't got no spunk left. All the dogs is licking at him. Wants to know what has become of you, and I don't know how to tell him. Maybe he's going to die. It was as Matt said. White Fang had ceased eating, lost heart, and allowed every dog of the team to thrash him. In the cabin, he lay on the floor near the stove, without interest in food, in Matt, nor in life. Matt might talk gently to him or swear at him. It was all the same. He never did more than turn his dull eyes upon the man, then drop his head back to its customary position on his forepaws. And then, one night, Matt, reading to himself with moving lips and mumbled sounds, was startled by a low whine from White Fang. He had got upon his feet, his ears cocked towards the door, and he was listening intently. A moment later, Matt heard a footstep. The door opened, and Reed and Scott stepped in. The two men shook hands, then Scott looked around the room. Where's the wolf? he asked. Then he discovered him, standing where he had been lying, near to the stove. He had not rushed forward after the manner of other dogs. He stood, watching and waiting. Holy smoke, Matt exclaimed. Look at him wag his tail. Reed and Scott strode half across the room toward him, at the same time calling him. White Fang came to him, not with a great bound, yet quickly. He was awkward from self-consciousness, but as he drew near, his eyes took on a strange expression. Something, an incommunicable vastness of feeling, rose up into his eyes as a light and shone forth. He never looked at me that way all the time he was gone, Matt commented. Reed and Scott did not hear. He was squatting down on his heels, face to face with White Fang and patting him, rubbing at the roots of the ears, making long caressing strokes down the neck to the shoulders, tapping the spine gently with the balls of his fingers and White Fang was growling responsively, the crooning note of the growl more pronounced than ever. But that was not all. What of his joy, the great love in him, ever searching and struggling to express itself, succeeded in finding a new mode of expression. He suddenly thrust his head forward and nudged his way in between the master's arm and body. And here, confined, hidden from view, all except his ears, no longer growling, he continued to nudge and snuggle. The two men looked at each other. Scott's eyes were shining. Gosh, said Matt in an awe-stricken voice. A moment later, when he had recovered himself, he said, 
I always insisted that Wolf was a dog. Look at him. With the return of the Love Master, White Fang's recovery was rapid. Two nights and a day he spent in the cabin, then he sallied forth. The sled dogs had forgotten his prowess. They remembered only the latest, which was his weakness and sickness. At the sight of him, as he came out of the cabin, they sprang upon him. Talk about your roughhouses, Matt murmured gleefully, standing in the doorway and looking on. Give him hell, you wolf, give him hell, and then some. White Fang did not need the encouragement. The return of the Love Master was enough. Life was flowing through him again, splendid and indomitable. He fought from sheer joy, finding in it an expression of much that he felt and that otherwise was without speech. There could be but one ending. The team dispersed in ignominious defeat, and it was not until after dark that the dogs came sneaking back, one by one, by meekness and humility, signifying their fealty to White Fang. Having learned to snuggle, White Fang was guilty of it often. It was the final word. He could not go beyond it. The one thing of which he had always been particularly jealous was his head. He had always disliked to have it touched. It was the wild in him, the fear of hurt and of the trap, that had given rise to the panicky impulses to avoid contacts. It was the mandate of his instinct that that head must be free. And now, with the love master, his snuggling was the deliberate act of putting himself into a position of hopeless helplessness. It was an expression of perfect confidence, of absolute self-surrender. As though he said, I put myself into thy hands, work thou thy will with me. One night, not long after the return, Scott and Matt sat at a game of cribbage, preliminary to going to bed. Fifteen two, fifteen four, and a pair makes six. Matt was pegging up, when there was an outcry and sound of snarling without. They looked at each other as they started to rise to their feet. The wolves nailed somebody, Matt said. A wild scream of fear and anguish hastened them. Bring the light, Scott shouted as he sprang outside. Matt followed with the lamp, and by its light they saw a man lying on his back in the snow. His arms were folded one above the other across his face and throat. Thus he was trying to shield himself from White Fang's teeth. And there was need for it. White Fang was in a rage, wickedly making his attack on the most vulnerable spot. From shoulder to wrist, off the crossed arms, the coat sleeve, blue flannel shirt and undershirt were ripped in rags, while the arms themselves were terribly slashed and streaming blood. All this the two men saw in the first instant. The next instant, we and Scott had White Fang by the throat and was dragging him clear. White Fang struggled and snarled, but made no attempt to bite, while he quickly quieted down at a sharp word from the master. Matt helped the man to his feet. As he arose, he lowered his crossed arms, exposing the bestial face of Beauty Smith. The dark musher let go of him precipitately, with action similar to that of a man who has picked up live fire. Beauty Smith blinked in the lamplight and looked about him. He caught sight of White Fang, and terror rushed into his face. At the same moment, Matt noticed two objects lying in the snow. He held the lamp close to them, indicating them with his toe for his employer's benefit. A steel dog chain and a stout club. Whedon Scott saw and nodded. Not a word was spoken. 
The dog musher laid his hand on Beauty Smith's shoulder and faced him to the right about. No word needed to be spoken. Beauty Smith started. In the meantime, the love master was patting White Fang and talking to him. He tried to steal you, eh? And he wouldn't have it. Well, well, he made a mistake, didn't he? Must have thought he had hold of seventeen devils, the dog musher sniggered. White Fang, still wrought up and bristling, growled and growled, the hair slowly lying down, the crooning note remote and dim, but crowing in his throat.